Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, Catholic lay leader and former head of the Church's Truth, Justice and Healing Council, Francis Sullivan. The lawyer who's represented hundreds of survivors of institutional sex abuse, Viv Waller. Liberal Senator and Architect of Operation Sovereign Borders, Jim Molan. Former New South Wales Premier, now Labor Senator, Christina Keneally. And Relationship Counselor and the man described as America's best-known rabbi, Shmuley Botek. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC, on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, tonight we'll be discussing the implications of George Pell's conviction. It's important here we make it clear that George Pell has lodged an appeal and continues to maintain his innocence. Well, our first question comes from former detective inspector who investigated child sex abuse in the Newcastle Catholic Diocese, Peter Fox. Um, I'll probably um, ask this of uh, Christina Keneally if I can. But uh, following the overturning of Archbishop Wilson's conviction, and uh, might I say many survivors were disappointed, but ultimately respected the judicial process. In view of that, considering the outpouring of emotion following Cardinal Pell's conviction, and particularly the commentary from uh, many media commentators and very prominent and powerful individuals aligned to Cardinal Pell, um, and I might add also a number of notable lawyers have also weighed in, uh, publicly discussing prospects of the appeal. After media suppression to ensure Cardinal Pell's trial received a fair trial, do you think current commentary is placing undue influence on the courts and potentially damaging integrity and public perception of any future appeal? Christina Canelli, go ahead. Thanks, Peter. And uh, first of all, I would say anyone who is passing comment on the jury verdict unless they were in the room every day, they heard everything the jury heard, they had access to all the information the jury had, well, they're actually doing a great disservice by have running that public commentary. They're doing a disservice to our democratic jury system, uh, first of all, and I'm quite uh, surprised and distressed that people like John Howard and Tony Abbott, but particularly Mr Howard, are running this type of commentary and providing uh, support publicly for Cardinal Pell following his conviction. I think it's disrespectful of the jury verdict. I also would... I also would reflect, it's quite disrespectful of victims. The main reason victims often fail to come forward is because they don't believe... they don't think they're going to be believed. And what do we have here? We've had a legal process, due process, a trial. A jury has rendered a decision, and now we have people out there casting doubt on that decision because they say they know this man and they don't believe he could have done it. This is exactly what happens when it comes to child sexual abuse and victims don't think they'll be believed. Now, I still have faith in the integrity of our legal system. I still believe that uh, the Cardinal has a right to lodge his appeal and I believe it will be treated appropriately. But the disrespect that's being shown to the jury and the disrespect that's being shown to victims by this public commentary is, is quite extraordinary and, frankly, it should stop. Jim Mullen, do you share that view? N not, not entirely, Tony. I, I, I think that uh, a critical part of what we do, Peter, is the character references that are given to uh, people prior to a sentencing. Uh, and I think that was the role that it played. I, there was some commentary that was pretty appalling. There's also been some commentary I thought that was very, very good, where they write, where comment, commentators such as Geraldine Doog or, or Frank Brennan or, or, or Paul Kelly raised issues which I think were legitimate to raise. Well, Paul Kelly um, was not alone in this because Andrew Bolt, um, Piers Ackerman and others raised the notion that Pell had been made a scapegoat for the ills of the Catholic Church that he presided over. Now. Do you think that's true? Is there any element ah, in your view? Uh, th that, that is far, far too hard for me to, to, to make a decision at the moment. Like Christina, I have great faith in our, in our uh, uh, legal system. And I was talking to Viv before we came in here, and Viv was saying there's something like 600 cases which are still going through. Uh, I had kind of hoped that I would be able to say tonight that uh, 
one of the victims, and, and, and I acknowledge the victim of the one we're talking about, plus the victims of all the people, particularly uh, the one that struck me almost more than anything else, and that was the Kevin O'Donnell case, the two girls. Uh, 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 I, I, I think that we can legitimately say uh, that most of the people out of Ballarat are in jail doing time. Uh, the system has acted. Of course, I understand, I understand the anger of so many people in the room. But I want to believe that not everyone in the Catholic Church is bad. I want to believe that some of the victims are good clerics who have dedicated themselves and their lives uh, to being good clerics. So we're talking... I'll, I'll stick... We'll, we'll get a chance to talk yep. more generally, but right now that question was about the criticism that's been made specifically of the jury system. It seems to me we haven't seen this sort of heated discussion about a jury verdict in a very long time. Well, what I've got to say is I'm, I'm absolutely astonished about the, the, the involvement of our society in this. Uh, as a Catholic, I kind of... Uh, it hasn't been the major thing in my life. It hasn't been the major thing in, in, in society's life. It's just an absolute tragedy that uh, what has happened has brought this into, into, into such focus. But I'm not going to comment on... Uh, I, I, the, the three that I mentioned I thought were good, others I didn't mention, and I'll make no comment. OK, we'll come back to that. Francis Sullivan, um, what do you think about the, the question, first of all? Stick to that. And Christina Keneally raised the point it's disrespectful both of the jury and of the victim witness. Yeah, thanks for the question, Peter. I mean, I think it's a question that a lot of people have in their minds. I think they're worried about the, the process from here because, let's face it, George Pell is a very divisive character and uh, people have a view about him a long time before this trial. And I think that's in the swirl of things. But I agree with uh, everybody at this point. We don't want to put the victim now on trial mm. by suggesting that somehow maybe what they said was wrong. And that's what this debate's doing. And I don't want to be part of any cheer squad that tries to do that. For too long in the Catholic Church, people who were abused weren't believed. They were actively silenced. The weight of the church, the might of the church, either, you know, negotiated them away disregarded them, told them to go home and left them to a life of peril, a life of misery. And as we know, most people who have been abused in the Catholic Church have told nobody and lived lives of real misery. So as far as I'm concerned, everyone should just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good <laughs> I think we should make the point here that the, uh, the victim in the Pell case uh, in which he's been convicted uh, is also your client. Yes, he <clears throat> is. Thank you. Um, and I think it's important to remember that there are a lot of checks and balances in the criminal justice system. And we didn't arrive at this point flippantly or without regard for due process. My client elected to report matters to the police. The police have conducted their own independent investigation and they formed the view that the evidence was such that charges should be laid. The Office of Public Prosecutions has reviewed that material and they have formed their own independent view um, that a prosecution should go ahead. Um, it has been through the committal process. A magistrate has reviewed the evidence and formed the view that there is sufficient evidence to, to establish a prima facie case to answer. It has gone to trial under the guidance of the, you know, an experienced uh, judge, the Chief Justice. Um, the accused person has been represented by experienced and well-regarded um, defence counsel, as he should be, um, and a jury of, um, you know, 12 good women and men have uh, reached a verdict. And I think the danger with some of the opinions being expressed by people who have not actually heard the evidence is that it can tend to besmirch all parts of that process. And really, the only opinion that matters really is the final check and balance. Because if there has been any difficulty in those processes, uh, then I'm sure that the Court of Appeal will act accordingly. Now, your client has chosen to remain anonymous. Um, probably a very smart decision, considering the spotlight that would be on him 
otherwise, but are you worried um, with people openly questioning, um, I guess, his truthfulness, as Francis said, the truthfulness of the victim in this case, are you worried about the pressure that he is going to be under? Look, he's quite aware of the fact that the criminal process is not yet over and it has been a very stressful journey for him and he is aware that, that there is more to come. Um, he is a witness in the Crown's case. Um, he has no agency over the way in which the case is put together, run. Uh, none of those decisions are decisions that he makes. Um, and although he is the centre of, um, you know, worldwide media interest, he has had very little agency in the way in which things have unfolded. Um, he is wisely um, respecting the integrity of the process and keeping him, his thoughts to himself. Um, and he'll continue to do that, but it is a very stressful time for him. Rabbi Shmuley, um, I'll bring you in. You, you arrived in Australia on the day the suppression order was lifted. Uh, your impressions of the case as a, a visiting uh, religious person? Well, as someone who's visited Australia for uh, three decades, um, I think the country is deeply traumatised by this story mm -hmm. in a way that no one is fully recognising. Here you have one of the most famous Australians in the world, really a global religious statesperson, who is uh, the most senior religious figure in the country, being accused or, and convicted now of unspeakable crimes. And we need not be the most religious society to still be deeply traumatized by the conversation, by the, the, the degree of the allegations and now this conviction. And I understand these differing views. Let's face it, in a democratic society, you're never gonna suppress people's opinions about any kind of, uh, of, of any kind of adjudication in a court. When, with the O.J. Simpson trial, I remember that half the country believed that justice had been done, that a, that a man had been vindicated, and half the country believed that a, that a man got away with murder. And we're always going to question jury verdicts. We're not going to suppress those views. But I do, I would like to say that, you know, seven years ago on this show, Cardinal Pell was here, and he made a famous statement that uh, was not received well in the Jewish community. He said that the Jewish community, he was surprised that God chose Jesus because the Jews were not an intellectual people because they had not been part of a great civilization. <clears throat> One of the most important intellectual ideas that Judaism gave the world was that no man is God. Therefore, everyone is fallible and everyone is accountable. It's difficult to accept that a person of such high religious standing could be guilty of such heinous crimes. And he may indeed be innocent, but we, there must be accountability. Because I agree with Francis, we have not listened to people sufficiently. And the cognitive, I was Michael Jackson's rabbi. If you think it's easy for me to now see the kind of accusations that were made in the past, but now seem more corroborated by new documentaries, this is painful as heck. And you go through trauma when you believe you know someone and now there's a whole dimension of their lives, which you just cannot believe is the case. But still, the victims have to be heard. Let's move on, thank you very much. Uh, our next question is from Amanda Votes. Yes, hello, panel. When I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, um, my sense of security came from my parents, my grandparents and the Catholic Church uh, and through the teachings of the Catholic faith, um, it gave me a great sense of security. In, um, in Australia, um, almost 25% of the population is made up of Catholics. Um, Given that uh, this situation with Cardinal Pell has occurred, there's going to be a lot of um, sorrowful and perhaps even depressed people throughout the country. Uh, how do the panel suggest we come to terms with this? Given that human beings are frail and, um, and, and you know, uh, flawed human beings, um, the church um, to us as Catholics was sacrosanct and above and beyond sinful acts. Um, how do you suggest, you know, a, a, a quarter of the country come to terms with it? Because we're part of the victimhood as well, apart from, you know, the, um, the children, so. Christina, yeah, has this tested your faith and perhaps the Royal Commission before that mm. in the church? that you were brought up in? Oh, absolutely. Uh, like Amanda, I was raised in a Catholic family. The Catholic Church was everything to our family. Uh, and I don't think I had a day uh, in my working career that wasn't a, in the Catholic Church uh, before I entered politics. Uh, my whole life was centred around studying theology and working uh, in the mission of the church. 
You know, I don't have an answer, Amanda. I really don't. And I, I'm going to agree with Rabbi Shmuley here that I think the nation is still is traumatized. I think Catholics are traumatized. You know, I have long lost faith in the institution of the Catholic Church. And I mourn the loss of my faith community. But I made a decision a few years ago that I could not, as a lay person, continue to prop up a failing and decaying institution with my voluntary labor and my money. And I would say to the women of Australia, the Catholic women of Australia, you know, let's consider what would happen if all Catholic women withdrew their voluntary labor from the Catholic Church, which really does prop up the system. You know, I don't have an answer. I don't. You know, I, my faith in a loving God is, is there most days. And I try to pray and I try to reflect and I try to find like-minded people to talk to. But I find so many Catholics around me that I speak to in the same boat. You know, some people who just go to mass because it's a habit and they see their friends there. Some people who've given up on going to mass altogether. Mass attendance has fallen off a cliff in Australia. And I, I really do think uh, the nation is traumatized, particularly the Catholic portion. I, I, if, if you and I can come up with an answer later, I don't know, maybe Jim, you can... Well, I'm actually I'm interested, I'll, well. I will go to Jim. Jim, you're also a Catholic. I mean, mm. uh, do you find uh, personal trauma looking at, well, now a huge number of cases uh, involving Catholic priests and now right up to the very top of the church uh, abusing children? Well, and, and as I kind of intimated before, I was hoping it was pretty well over and Viv has disabused me of that idea. But, Amanda, I, 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 I don't have uh, an answer, but uh, I grew up in a Catholic family, uh, four sisters and a brother, and they were, for a period of time they were all very religious, as, we, as I guess we all were. And uh, one, one of my sisters is still striving very, very hard to be a good Catholic, uh, despite the church, uh, the others uh, the others still have a great spiritual life. Uh, but but I, I think, particularly for women, in my observation, uh, the church has failed them, particularly as believers. Uh, I, I would like to, to to comment if I could, and, and I'm uh, I'm I'm just a, a, a lazy Catholic. I'm a, I'm kind of hedging in case God does exist, which does worry me considerably. <laughs> but uh, uh, I. I uh, I, I would say that the church has been through this before, and it's been it's been through appalling times. I mean, it's only two thousand years old. Uh, it still hasn't figured out a whole bunch of things that I think most of us have figured out. What are you talking about, Jim? The Inquisition? <laughs> well, that, that, that didn't go all that well. Not so. Well. Uh, the role of women in the church. The role of women as priests. Uh, a thousand things that society is moving ahead on. Uh, and I'm not. I'm not, in this instance, advocating it. Maybe I'm, we'll I'm get to that I'm later. We will, yeah, and absolutely. I might hold you off good. on that question. Um, that, that'd be good to get to. Let me to. go to, to Viv. And mm -hmm. the word sacrosanct was used there in relation to the church. And, of course, the final report of the Royal Commission pointed mm -hmm. to uh, cleric, uh, clericalism um, and the idea that priests, once <laughs> ordained, are effectively sacrosanct. That is, they're like a piece of God on earth and the effect that that had on the minds of some priests? So the Royal Commission spent quite a bit of time examining what might be the underlying factors that have contributed to high rates of abuse uh, in the Catholic Church. And I'll just say that the, the Royal Commission conducted up to 8,000 or just over 8,000 private sessions where it spoke with survivors. And a lot of those people reported the role of the person who they alleged had harmed them. And 31.8% of those participants said that they were harmed by a person in religious ministry. 60% um, of people who um, engaged with the Royal Commission said that they were harmed in, an, in a religious institution. And of that 60%, of that cohort, 64% um, of them reported that it happened in a Catholic institution. So the deep pain that Amanda and other people are feeling comes not just from this current case, but if we truly come to grips with what we have learned from a five-year National Royal Commission of Inquiry, we need to accept that there's a, there's a real issue with the Catholic Church. Tell us church. exactly what clericalism means, because the, the Vatican is now struggling with this. Yes. Um, and the question is whether the Pope, in fact, does something about it. 
Well, I think the idea of clericalism really is something that's at the heart of the Catholic Church. The idea that um, priests or clergy are somehow ontologically changed at the time of their ordination, that they actually become God here on earth, particularly during the administration, you know, of the Catholic rites. And I think that has put clergy um, in an enormous position of power and it has generated the concept that, that, that clergy and priests are somehow sacrosanct, they're higher in the pecking order than lay people, they are closer to God, that parishioners in a Catholic church can't commune directly with their God at those important moments of their life, they must go through the through the local priest. And this attitude of superiority has really, I think, diminished the voices of survivors and their family. It has made the Catholic Church act in a way that would protect its own interests, its own reputation, protect the priests. It would do that at the expense of the very values that it purports to uphold as part of its faith and belief. And so my understanding of clericalism is the kind of corruption of the institution of the church. And, and Amanda, just going back to your question, in the course of my work, I've acted for thousands of survivors of sexual abuse. And the heartbreak that I hear from parents, from well-meaning, decent, hard-working <laughs> Catholic parents that have sent their kids to Catholic schools only to have their trust betrayed in the most awful of ways. And of course, the survivors often, for reasons that we understand, lose their faith. And then parents are left with the additional heartbreak of thinking that upon passing, they're not going to see their children again. And these are very important things for, for people of faith. So Amanda, the only thing I can suggest, and I'm, I'm not Catholic and I'm not really a religious person, but I spend a lot of my time hearing about the despair that this causes in families. People, survivors don't feel comfortable going to somebody's funeral or a sibling's wedding um, and, it, and it causes deep despair. And the only thing I can say to, to decent Catholic people is don't let your, your church or your faith be stolen from you by, the, by corruption in the institution. Let me throw that to uh, Francis, uh, lay leader in the church. Is it time for the laity to take charge, at least in part, of dealing with these fundamental issues which the bishops and indeed the Vatican seem incapable of dealing with? Yes, um, Amanda, um, over the six years that I did the job of coordinating with the Royal Commission of the Catholic Church's engagement, I also went out across Australia of an evening to parishes to talk about the scandal and everyone said, gee, this is the first time that adult Catholics had a chance to talk about what had gone on in their church. And as we always know, part of the clericalism impact is that church treats adults like kids. And we adults sort of get compliant with that. We allow the power structure to be the way it is. And I think the paradigm shifts happening. There's got to be a new term of engagement between lay people and the institutional church. It's really important to always remind everybody, we are the church. The institution is just the organised expression and administration. But the trouble is we've put so much store in that, we took our eye off the ball too. And there's a sort of collective responsibility we Catholics have now as adults about the church we want to be, how we want to be it. Most of my adult life, the Catholic Church has basically hectored me on how to do life instead of being a resource to help me negotiate life. It's a different attitude we need, new terms of engagement. And the one key would be we as adult uh, Catholics should start talking about the trauma and insisting, whether it's a priest, whether it's a bishop, insisting that we are mutual in this. And we so, shouldn't you know, be hanging Francis, around can I, just, can I just interrupt you just for a moment and briefly? <coughs> does that mean you'd have to break the power of the bishops, the cardinals and the Vatican? Well, sex abuse is all about the abuse of power. 
and power, privilege and those who got to participate were the overseers of the abuse scandal. So we have to change that. OK, let's move on to our next question. We've got quite a few. We'll try and get to as many as possible. The next question is from Albert Morris. Well, Thank you. I see the unnatural state of celibacy that is imposed <clears throat> on the priests by the Catholic, Roman Catholic hierarchy is uh, they're in position of power. And those people in position of power that abuse that power for uh, illicit sexual gratification is entirely predictable mm. because they are in position of power and they're deprived of a natural outcome of their sexuality. So we define nature at our peril. It's now acceptable for the Maronite priests to be married mm. and similarly the Jewish uh, system that although not mandatory but highly recommends that rabbis are all married. So it's now high time for the Catholic Church to change that stupid rule of celibacy yeah. on the uh, uh, yeah. their uh, priests and uh, now get back to what nature demands. <laughs> Thank you, Albert. I'll actually, I'll, I'll throw this straight to Rabbi Shmuel. <laughs> since, you, since you were mentioned in passing. Well, well Albert, I, uh, the reason I wrote Kosher Sex is that I believe sex is intimate and passionate. It should be erotic in a marriage. Sex is not for procreation only, or pregnant women and postmenopausal women would not enjoy sex, which they do. It is not purely recreational, because we've seen the kind of pain that uh, the Me Too movement has exposed, where, it's, where recreational sex leads to um, abuses. Um, sex is about intimacy. Nothing more beautiful about sex has ever been said than Genesis 2.24, therefore shall a man leave his mother and leave his father, he shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Sex is the motion that brings forth emotion. It takes two strangers and it sews, sews them together so that they feel indivisible. Well, as Jaja Gabor said, a man is only half until he's married, then he's finished. <laughs> 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 but but I, 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 so I, I, I believe in, in sex and I think that the pontificate of Pope Francis, who is trying to reform the church, will not be complete until he does address the issue of papal celibacy, uh, I'm sorry, of priestly celibacy, and let us recall, that for the first thousand years of the Catholic Church, priests were married and many popes were married. Having, having said that, we have not established a direct link between Absolutely. priestly celibacy on the one hand and pedophilia on the other. And it's unfair to the vast majority of extremely decent moral priests who are extremely altruistic in their calling to say that because they're celibate, there's gonna be aberrant behavior. I will say that sex is not a luxury. Sex is a human necessity. And, and it is high time for religion in general, and the Catholic Church in particular, to address the decline of sex, not just in marriage, but its misuses, its abuses. Sex is broken everywhere today. It's not just a cardinal who's been convicted, which is a tragedy, especially for the victims. It's not just Me Too and so many women who, who are feeling alienated in the culture from a toxic masculinity. It's the platonic marriages. In the United States, the average American marriage has sex once a week for seven minutes at a time, which includes the time the husband spends begging. And, <laughs> and when I tell the Australian husbands, like, once a week, they're thinking, God almighty, are all you American men on a Viagra drip? Like, how do you do this? <laughs> sex is broken, and religion should, should be leading the way in fixing it, because we shouldn't have women feeling so alienated from an intimate culture. We should not have priests who are paying this horrible price. And above all else, we shouldn't have children who are paying that price. Yeah. And I think the brokenness of sex, it's amazing that this isn't being discussed when we see mm. the pain it's causing all yeah. around. All right. Um, 
Christina, uh, celibacy, <laughs> having an issue. Oh, by the way, I, I must say, that of our questioner, you're getting the wisdom of a 94-year-old. Uh, two issues about priests in the Catholic Church and ordination. One, you've hit upon, uh, mandatory celibacy. Uh, I don't think it should be mandatory. I should be it optional. We also, when priests, and you take the generation that Cardinal Powell entered the priesthood, they would have got them at 15, 16, 17 years old. These are men going into a seminary, being told you will be celibate, and then being given very few tools to deal with that or how to manage that. Uh, and then as priests go through their career, they get very little in the way of counseling, mentoring, professional development, monitoring, whatever. So ordinate, priesthood itself is, is, is flawed and broken. I would also say ordination is a big problem. Francis talked about the need to uh, take back power. The problem in the Catholic Church is that ordination equals power. Mm -hmm. And only celibate men can be ordained. And that means that celibate men make the rules. And they preserve power to themselves. And you know, when Viv talks about clericalism, she's spot on. The clerical class of the Catholic Church has utterly failed. And this is what they need to address, that they have used ordination as a way to preserve power to themselves. And I would say, possibly, the best way to deal with this is not to get rid of ordination or get rid of, of celibacy as a gift. For some people, it is a gift. But to open ordination up, open it up to married men, open it up to women, open it up for short-term ordination or perhaps if someone wanted to make that lifelong commitment. You know, I once sat in my church while the priest told us to pray because we had a shortage of vocations. Sitting around me was one man who'd left the priesthood. He was married. And there were three of us women who had degrees in theology. And none of us were allowed to take up the job because we didn't fit that physical requirement that they had set up, and they set it up so that they could preserve power to themselves. Uh, you've, uh, you've forecast a little bit one of the questions we we're going to go to. I'll go straight to uh, Megan Powell Detroit now um, so that we can discuss that and the previous question. Go ahead, Megan. I'm a female Baptist minister, and so my question's to you, Christina Keneally. Um, my experience has been that a lot of women who've experienced abuse from own, in my own tradition, but also from other traditions where there's few or no female clergy come to me yep. to tell me those stories. And so I was wondering, with your um, studies in theology and your experience as a female political leader, what mm -hmm. difference would it make to abuse within the church if we had more women in positions and having voices of influence. Okay, briefly on that, Chris. Very briefly, to... Megan, I think it would make a world of difference, an absolute world of difference. You know, if women and parents, women religious, married people were involved in the decision making when the complaints about sexual abuse started to arise, I think we would have had a much different outcome. It's a lack of accountability, a lack of democracy, and a lack of participation from the full body of the church that has led us to where we are. Jim. What do you think? Well, I think as a class, uh, the, the, the clerical class have failed. As individuals, many, many of them have not, and it must be hurting them very, very badly. Uh, in, the the, the uh, institution, the, the, the inquiry, Francis, that you went through for many, many years was an institutional sexual abuse inquiry, and, and my understanding is that uh, a, a large proportion of sexual abuse comes from within the family. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's correct. That's my understanding of members of the family do it. So maybe, sir, the answer is not that, 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 uh, 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 that uh, uh, the fact that uh, priests, that, that, that clerics are not permitted to marry is the source of it. The fact that uh, I absolutely agree with what Christina said, we, we should have more women. Of course we should. It should be optional. It is so out of date, it's not funny. I don't see Pope Francis at the moment moving in that area at any at the moment in any way, shape or form. And I think we saw that by the fact that his investigation into, uh, into sexual abuse within the church consisted of a bunch of men, none of whom were married. Hear, mm. hear. Viv, um, once again, the Royal Commission um, devoted some time to looking at the psychology and particularly the sexual psychology of offending priests, pedophile priests. What conclusions did they reach? Well, I think celibacy really is only part of the problem and the Royal Commission recommended that celibacy should be optional 
so there could still be a role for it. But the Royal Commission looked at some of the individual factors that might have led to this sort of perfect storm of offending within the church. They looked at the mental health of priests and religious. They looked at what they called psychosexual immaturity. Some of the Christian brothers were joining the order or recruited into the order at the age of 14. I mean, I defy anyone to know what they want to do with their life and their sexuality at the age of, of 14. The other kinds of individual factors went to um, sort of lack of maturity generally or possibly narcissistic personality disorders, um, believing that you are God's representative here on earth. I don't mean any disrespect to people who believe in ontological change, but I mean to draw attention to the, the power that people in those positions have and that kind of power is really easily misused. One of the risk factors that the Royal Commission identified for children is if their parents held a particular organisation in very high esteem. Mm. And this relates back to what we're talking about, what Christine is talking about, the, the power of the church vesting in uh, a very limited kind of range so, of people. Because it's harder for them to imagine that anything bad can have happened. Yes. I mean, if, you're, if you subscribe to the Catholic faith and you hold those beliefs, it is beyond comprehension that um, if your child is able to come home and say that something has happened, it's kind of beyond your capacity to understand or comprehend. Certainly in decades gone by. And I have heard accounts of extremely manipulative behaviour. The child is um, alleged to have been sexually abused at school. By the time they run all the way home from school, the priest or the Christian brother uh, is actually at their house having a cup of tea with their mother. So the kind of power that the priest has to um, know so much about families, to know which children are vulnerable, to know, you know, whose dad's a drinker or whose mum's had a miscarriage, which children have been a bit naughty and might not be believed anyway. anyway. I mean, you'd have to address that kind of underlying kind of power. Um, so I think celibacy is part of it and I accept the argument that, that some people make that celibacy um, might have something to do with it, but I think it falls short of explaining too much of it. OK. Francis, um, celibacy and the prospect of women, married men becoming priests, um, is that where you think the church needs to go now? Well, firstly, Albert, um, I think it's common sense. Even though celibacy doesn't cause the abuse, uh, sexual abuse of children, it was a significant contributing factor. And the church needs to front that and not just dismiss the argument because it's not causative. It was a contributing factor, particularly in the, as Viv uh, eloquently said, the psychosexual tension that some individuals had, the loneliness and so on that was associated with their lifestyle, part of their lifestyle is to be celibate. So I think the church really has to front that and not, you know, not try and... Uh, <coughs> in a sense, spin the, spin the argument away. Where should the church be moving now? Obviously, if you look at the Australian scene, there is a shortage of priests and the only place the priests are really coming from is outside of Australia. And for about the 10% of Catholics who practise, they are finding at times it difficult to relate to the individuals who are now their priest and the priests themselves are finding it difficult. And there's only one reason for that. And that's because we don't open up the ministry, as Christina said, to former priests, to married men and to women. It doesn't have to be a debate just about women because, you know, the bishops panic then. It's a debate about opening up the, the whole Holy Orders debate into making Australia, an Australian Catholic Church, where Australians are ministering to each other about Australians' lifestyles so we can relate to each other and we can be, look, um, if women walked away from the church on a Sunday, you'd hear crickets. <laughs> you think, by the way, do you think the Australian church could go it alone here? No, they, they won't go it alone, they won't go alone on anything. <laughs> I mean... There are a lot of things that the Australian bishops should be advancing, but they seem really paranoid about Rome. 
OK, let's move on. You're watching Q&A Live. Our next question comes from Chrissy Foster, whose two daughters, Emma and Katie, were raped by Melbourne priest Kevin O'Donnell while they were at primary school in the 1980s. Chrissy. <coughs> Thank you. I think this one might be for Francis. Sure. Why, when children are the essence of Christianity, trusting, loving, innocent and virginal, do some clergy sexually assault them and then, after complaints, all the bishops worldwide protect the offenders by moving them to another parish, aiding and abetting them in future crimes, sometimes for decades? Thanks, Chrissy. Uh, the first part of the question is why do um, priests and religious abuse little children? I sat in there for five years and I kept shaking my head about why. I mean, instinctively, it doesn't... It, it, do, it doesn't make sense. But secondly, it's appalling. And I could only say, from listening to the Royal Commission reports, they're sick. These people are sick. And it's evil. And I can't explain evil beyond that. The real other big crime is then the show covering it up. And why does that happen? Because there's a club. It's part of clericalism. And I think, unfortunately, too, men are more permissive of the sexual, sexual behaviour of men than they should be. And I think there's been too much excusing, too much permissiveness, and then ultimately an instinctive defensiveness that somehow seems to, seems to value the good name of the institution above the welfare of a child. And if you put those two things together and look at everything the Royal Commission has said and recommended, Unless the Catholic bishops of Australia, on every recommendation, can demonstrate that the welfare of the child is the number one priority, then they've failed again. Mm -hmm. Chrissy, there was another part of your question, and I'll let you answer, let you ask that now, I should say. Okay. How can politicians still let the church set up and run their own money saving, victim demeaning schemes? Uh, Francis, I'll go back to you on that and I want to hear from the rest of the panel on it, but uh, the Melbourne response was Cardinal Pell's answer to this. Um, should, it be, should it be discontinued immediately? Yes. The days of the church investigating itself are meant to be over. Um, that's the whole reason why there's a national redress scheme. Uh, the Catholic Church leadership signed off on our recommendations that they should, when it comes to civil uh, actions, they should provide an entity that can be sued. They should act like a model litigant and not play tricky games. Now, that's what they said they would do. But they're not doing it, Francis, is that what you're saying? Because they yes. appear to be, at the very least, dragging their feet, um, to put it mildly. I think, uh, as I've said before, the Catholic Church uses inertia as a management tool. They drag their feet on purpose. And unfortunately, even when there can be a pronouncement on high from major archbishops. It, doesn't, it isn't followed through on the ground by particular orders or, or dioceses. They're all uh, a law unto themselves. What the Catholic Church needs in this area, I totally agree, it should be shut down, the, the internal redress schemes and reparation schemes, but the church needs an ombudsman-type role mm. where it brings bishops into account because they're accountable only to the Pope. And we've seen recently that even the Pope, who I like, has a real blind spot in this area. He is not strong enough in this area. And he is too, I think, intimidated by colleagues like cardinals and other significant influential clerics. Uh, Christina, I'll, I'll bring you in here. And um, we should note, actually, that uh, one of the policemen who was involved in the Pell case said today, not only were the police, uh, was the church uh, not helpful 
Mm. But they were behaving like uh, demonstrators, uh, lying on the road, having to be dragged off. Um, that was his analogy. And it did seem quite an appropriate one when you heard what was going on. Yeah, look, uh, Labor has a view that the uh, failure of the church to sign up as a single entity is quite disappointing. Uh, it does uh, put victims in a terrible position. Uh, we supported the National Redress Scheme because it was the option that was available. It was a sound scheme. We do think it should be uh, changed, though. Uh, it is a federal scheme, though. The states have all signed up to it as well. So changing it is not a unilateral decision for a federal government. But were we to be elected, uh, we would like to see some changes to it. We would like to see the compensation go up to what the Royal, Co uh, the Royal Commission recommended, $200,000. Uh, we would like to see victims have adequate time to consider the redress offers that have been put to them. Uh, we would like to ensure that they're getting adequate counselling and support as they go through the process. Yeah. I would have argued long before this Cardinal Pell case came about that the Melbourne response should be shut down. Uh, and that is what the National Redress Scheme is supposed to achieve, that we move away from the churches investigating themselves and keeping it all in-house to something that is far more transparent and accountable. Uh, yeah, I, they don't have to sign up to the scheme till 2020, mid-2020. So we're in a situation now where institutions should be feeling the public pressure. And I would say putting a spotlight on those sections of the Catholic Church and other institutions that haven't yet signed up is what we need to start doing. And asking them why. Why haven't you signed up to this scheme? Mm -hmm. Uh, Rabbi Shmuley, uh, in the United States, um, where you face very similar problems, um, some prosecutors are using RICO laws. That is to say they're treating the church as if they're mobsters. Um, do you think that's kind of where we're at now? Well, what we see with this conversation is that this we're now discussing a referendum on the church in general and religion in general, and not just on sexual abuse, as we're kind of going to whether churches should be regulated, what should be the interplay between politics uh, and between the church and faith in general. So I think it's important to say, now firstly, I, I think that is going a bit too far. I think it's critical to say that faith plays a vital role in the lives of billions of people around the world. You know, Viv is correct that we have to be careful not to idolize an institution to the point where we don't question clerics, where we turn a blind eye believing that they're superhuman in some way and they can't do any wrong. But let's not become cynics. There's also the need for idealism. The fact is that the sexual abuses we've seen in the Me Too movement happened mostly so far, at least exposed in Hollywood. Very secular culture, nothing to do with religion. These people were certainly not celibate. Uh, we saw monstrous abuses. Um, the Catholic Church, for all of its shortcomings, remains one of the greatest forces for good in the entire world. It has the world's largest network of orphanages, of hospitals. Think about all the good that, th that nuns do and priests do. So I feel that we're almost taking this, we dare not become extremists. We have to find the golden middle path. For too long, we have minimized the incalculable harm done to a child when they are sexually abused. It was almost like because you couldn't see the harm, because you couldn't see the trauma, it, was, it wasn't so bad. We now know it's bad beyond description, that people kill themselves from these things, let alone their inability to trust and develop relationships, let alone the violation of the innocence of a child. So we've learned our lesson. Let's put that into context and pressure Pope Francis, who I think really wants to make serious changes, to make those changes. But for us to make this a, a general referendum, and I hear the pain of so many Catholics, sh sh why should I continue to pray? Why should I go to church? You don't go because of a priest. You go because you want to connect to God. You go because you want to lead a compassionate, ethical life. You go because you don't want to be like these hypocr hypocritical religious fraudsters who are religious in name only. Christine, you want to be the real thing. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, when you're going to an institution that is supposed to mediate God's grace and love, that says to you, through our sacraments, you will experience God, and through our priests, you can experience God's mercy and love, and then that very same institution does exactly the opposite of what Jesus said. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And you must be like a little child to enter the kingdom of God. But when that very same institution and those very same clerical class so violates what they preach, you have to ask, where is God's mercy? Where is God's love? And when that same institution 
which teaches people like me and all of us who've been through Catholic school what the act of contrition means. It supposedly means you confess your sins and you make a resolution to act differently. Where is the church's act of contrition? Where have they made a resolution to act differently? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, uh, 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 hang on, Rabbi. Uh, uh, Jim Mullen wants to get in. I, I, I was just going to say that uh, uh, I, I think one of the most important parts of what the Catholic Church is is that it's always said that we relate to God through the, through the clerical class. Yes. And that's a real problem. And yes. if, if in Judaism you can relate directly to God, that, that's fantastic. But the power that that gives clerics throughout the world, Catholic clerics throughout the world, is something which uh, 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 it doesn't particularly worry me, but if we want to go for changes, Francis, if we want to look at how the church may change and may grow, that I think that's going to be a real problem. To give up that role that the clerics have uh, makes us Anglicans, makes us Protestants, makes us something else. I'm not too sure what it makes us, but it, it, it may not make us Catholics. Okay, do you back uh, Christina and Labor's uh, call on the uh, compensation scheme? Oh, absolutely. $50,000 was never going to be enough. It was an, an absolute insult. And, and, and Chrissy, if I may call you that, I've I, I read your story. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I know God would never test me the way he's tested you because he knows I would fail. I, you, you have my greatest admiration. Viv. I'd also like to respond to Chrissy um, and her question about why. What we know about the circumstances of Kevin O'Donnell is that... The Archdiocese of Melbourne knew that he was a sexual predator in 1958. And Chrissy's children, her beautiful children, did not attend that school until the 90s. That was a harm that was completely avoidable if the Catholic Church or the Archdiocese of Melbourne in this particular matter had managed to do what every other decent Australian knows to be true. If you have reasonable grounds to suspect that a child is being sexually abused, you report that to the police. They, it got as far as the Vicar General um, that there were allegations against Father Kevin O'Donnell and nothing was ever done about it and he was never reported to the police. The Royal Commission found that this was a pervasive pattern and this also gets back to the idea about clericalism, that somehow the Catholic Church is not responsible to or accountable to the criminal justice system or the law of the jurisdiction in which it, it is. It sees itself as separate. It sees itself as having some God-given right to ignore the fact that there's reasonable grounds to suspect. Can I just put that there. back to uh, Chrissy, if I can? Um, first of all, your reaction uh, when George Pell's conviction became known to you? Uh, I was uh, really, really happy. I felt as though justice had been done, it, it had been served. I felt as though the, the wheels of justice had turned. I had faith in the process um, and I did not think that would happen. We went inch by inch by inch by inch for a long time to um, take it where it went. And um, it really filled me with confidence and awe in the judicial system. Am, am I right in saying that you took this to Pell personally? Sorry, no, I didn't um, take it. I shouldn't have said that. Um, no, I didn't say I you had, said it. Either. I had something to do um, with him a lot earlier, um, mm. back in 19... Um, 97. Okay, we'll leave you there. Thank you very much. We're going to have to move on to other topics. If anyone is watching tonight and feeling distressed by this discussion, please call Lifeline on 131114. The number's on your screen now, 131114. Uh, let's move to general politics. And we have a web question next from uh, Georgia Wilson in New South Wales. The Morrison government has recently been described as a sinking ship after the slew of Liberal resignations. With an imminent election, what steps will the Liberal Party be taking to, again, regain trust of voters during this crucial period? Jim. Very, very simple. Very, very simple, Tony. And I, uh, I didn't catch the name of the person that, that, that gave us the question. Uh, it really goes to uh, fundamental good policy. Uh, and we have fundamental good policy and it's coming out on a day-by-day -day basis. 
Uh, I, I, I'm fully aware of the fact that we're criticised over the, the, the turmoil that has been in our party for the last period of time. It's not an unusual turmoil. We have probably someone that I consider now to be running this... Um, to be running our party as, as the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, uh, who as a person is one of the most competent people I've seen. I work with him as you introduced me in Sovereign Borders. Uh, good leadership, good policies. The fact that people leave, they'll always leave. Uh, we've, all seen, we've all seen the enticements to leave that came through superannuation in the articles today. Uh, people will leave, uh, but uh, the, the, the depth of the Liberal Party, uh, both in the Parliament and outside the Parliament, were, will allow us to fight for the trust of the people. Christina. Six years and they're still developing their policies, apparently. <laughs> they don't have a wages policy. They don't have a climate policy. We well, have a they climate have, policy. Sorry, you do. You have Tony Abbott's we have a climate, climate policy. policy. <laughs> they have Tony Abbott's climate <laughs> policy. <laughs> $2.25 billion in five years of Tony Abbott's climate policy. We what do we get? Emissions going policy. up. Emissions going up and cost of power going up. Yeah, how can you not have a wages policy? How can you not have a climate policy? How can you not have an energy policy? You know, what we do know uh, is after six years of this government, the chaos and the division that we are seeing means everything uh, is going up for the Australian family except their wages. And that chaos and that division is having a real impact on the people of Australia. Uh, and that's why we need an election. And I would say we need an election now uh, so that we can get on and elect a government, a Labor government, that will put the Australian people first. It's a bit like that's what this government for an, for an election, but it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Well, bring it on, I say. Bring it on. OK, we've got another political question. Uh, I'll go straight to that uh, quickly. It's from Mehmet Soyuz Sadija. Scott Morrison has said that Labour's promise to review recent appointments is arrogant. Isn't it arrogant for the Liberals to feel entitled to these positions? If a Labour government is elected, wouldn't they have the right to fill these positions? I, I think this is... This is uh, uh, the hypocrisy of the Labour Party at the moment coming out in so deep... I, I, in a way which should, which should surprise no-one at all. We've lived for years with these kind of uh, appointments being made to good people to go overseas. Uh, 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 on a not irregular basis, people from other parties have been sent across overseas by, uh, by a party which didn't own them to begin with. It's, it's invariably uh, the best person for the job, a good person for the job, and I think it's the utmost of arrogance now to think so... to demand briefings for Labor Party politicians. I mean, Christina may even go and get the health briefing coming up pretty soon, I think, as, no. as, as she moves into... Catherine King ..as she anticipates that. moving into Cabinet. This is a case where... where it's always where, about the jobs, where, isn't, where it? So isn't it, Jim? It's always about who gets what job. I, I'm more interested in about your job and your wages. I, He's more interested in about the jobs they can appoint their mates to. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, sorry, uh, Christina, isn't it...? It's, it's certainly been reported widely that Labor has a hit list and, uh, and people have been told not to unpack well, you know, their bags when they arrive at their posts. You know, hello world. Exactly. Uh, hello yeah, world. Exactly. Is Joe Hockey the best guy to be representing us in the United States? He is a States? fantastic Oh, ambassador. yeah, he's, he's great if you want to book a holiday. He's Let me a tell you. Right ambassador. Call him up. Uh, you know, I'm really pleased to be part of a stable, united team. We've had Bill Shorten and Tanya Plibersek as our leaders for the past six years. We have a great wealth of experience in our Cabinet, and I am really looking forward to this election. Mm -hmm. And to make Cabinet spaces available, how many of them might end up <laughs> as ambassadors? Hang on, I can hear Kim Carr coming through. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Let's just be clear about one thing. Uh, this government has been recklessly appointing its mates to these plum jobs overseas. Uh, and it is not inappropriate for us to foreshadow that should the Australian people decide to place their trust in us, that we will be saying these very partisan appointments, some of whom are people who couldn't hang on to their jobs in Parliament because they had Section 44 and other issues, uh, you know, we are going to review these. And if we don't think that they are appropriate, we will make appropriate appointments. Now, Jim, just, just a quick one for you before we move on. We've got a, another question for yep. the whole panel. And, but just uh, how, how can you remain so loyal... <laughs> um, what the party has done to you in terms of where you've ended up on the Senate ticket because you effectively can't win. 
Well, uh, and, and that, that's quite true. Uh, uh, but I am a very loyal person. I'm a loyal person to the Liberal Party. I, I, I find extraordinary problems with the New South Wales division of the Liberal Party and the, and the, the Liberal Party, the, the, the machine that sits behind it. Uh, but uh, w uh, people are out there saying that I'm running a campaign for a below-the-line uh, uh, voting campaign. I, I'm not. Uh, many people who are supporting... Why not? No, many people who are... For, for the simple reason that I respect the Liberal Party. I don't respect the Liberal Party machine which sits behind it in New South Wales. I only know New South Wales and I've only known it for about three or four years. Uh, Doesn't the Prime Minister who comes from New South Wales have anything to do with the machine? Oh, well, you, you, you can ask him that question. The, the point that I make, though... I'd rather ask you. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> and I must admit, I have asked the Prime Minister that question myself. Yeah. But, what was uh, the answer? <laughs> <laughs> That's a private question. But what... A... <laughs> Just shared with all of us. Not any more, Jim, if I was... <laughs> Well, so few people watch Q&A. Oh! <laughs> I can probably share it with you quite safely. <laughs> but the point that I do make is that everyone in New South Wales has the right, as Malcolm Turnbull made it very, very easy, to vote below the line. I can't advocate they vote for me, but if you vote above the line, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can, I add, can I jump in here? Because we do politicians, we like to, you know, go at each other, right? Of course, it's an adversarial system. And of course, I will advocate you vote one Labor above the line. <laughs> but I will say this. I worked with Jim on the Select Committee and Inquiry into Stillbirth, and it was the first time in Australia we'd had a national look at this issue. It was a bipartisan committee. Uh, Jim and I both had personal experiences, my daughter Caroline, his granddaughter Emily, and he was amazing to work with. I'm just going to say that. He, in his military experience, meant a great deal, brought some real uh, strategic thinking to our work. And, and, you know, I'm a bit sad that your party hasn't put you <laughs> a bit higher up. Um, and and if, if you don't make it in your uh, campaign, or not your campaign, I will miss you, Jim. I guarantee you, Jim, <laughs> all people will watch this valedictory speech that the one that happens in Parliament. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's you. time for one last question. It's from Esther Fisher. OK, I guess that's for you, Rabbi. Um, in my opinion, pornography is just a symptom of a much bigger issue. Um, we as a society simply just don't know anymore what intimacy is and how it works. And people are becoming more and more isolated and loneliness is just spreading in our society like cancer. And there clearly is a need for pornography as evidenced by the huge supply there is. So my question is, instead of trying to eliminate pornography from our society, why aren't we trying to find a cure for loneliness? Rabbi Shmuley, um, I have to say that, that uh, Great Britain has a minister for loneliness, and it's an interesting concept maybe uh, other countries should take up. Well, it's one of the reasons, getting back to this issue of celibacy, the very first thing that the Bible says is bad is that it is bad for man to be alone, and that's the beginning of Genesis. I completely agree, but how is pornography possibly compensation for real human company? To the, to the, the exact opposite is true. Pornography is the living degradation of women. It trains the male mind to see a woman as a means to an end. It makes women into the walking embodiment of a male erotic fantasy. And it, it leads to disrespect because it means that women exist to fulfill those erotic fantasies. I actually think that it does a serious uh, toxic harm to how men view women and it makes them very objective about women, meaning the only synonym I can find for love is the word subjectivity, because to love is to be rendered subjective. Your emotions actually color and transform and enhance the object of your love. But when you become too objective, when you absorb thousands and thousands of these images, you learn to look at women very objectively to, to the extent that it's, it's difficult to be attracted to women, because you're no longer responding instinctually. You're responding almost psychologically. You're, you, it's, it's no longer a visceral attraction. Um, I'm astonished that the greatest technological uh, wonder that we've created since man stepped up on the moon, the internet, 70% of it is pornography and we don't talk about it. And the fact is that men have to learn how to be gentlemen. Men have to learn how to respect women. We focused a lot about the damage done to children. 
And I completely agree that every cleric has to help be held accountable. And we have to also emphasize that rabbis and priests and imams, we're only human beings and we struggle and, and we're not divine. And I agree with so much of that criticism. But let's not forget how many women are being turned off of sexuality because of the male approach. So loneliness is real. It has to be addressed. I don't know if we have to create a minister, but I'll volunteer myself to be Australia's minister of, uh, of love and loneliness. Uh, I'll be the love rabbi. But, uh, but, I, but I would love to see women stepping up and saying this is unacceptable. Do you know how many marriages I counsel where there is a living, breathing, beautiful wife naked in bed while her husband is online looking at fictional images of porn? And of course, Porn only works in great quantity. It no longer, Playboy, all these magazines were killed by internet porn because there's only one woman. If you click internet porn, tens of thousands of images suddenly arise, or so my friends tell me. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason is because it leads to boredom. It leads to erotic boredom. Famili familiarity breeds contempt. So it actually, it, it desensitizes us erotically. It diminishes attraction. It degrades women. It makes m men incapable of being attracted to one woman. And finally, it makes sex so boring because porn uses just a few formulaic uh, sexual devices that are always the same. It stifles real sexual creativity and it makes men think that sex is not sensual. It's not about connecting with a woman, but it's about doing things to a woman. And I think its toxicity finally has to be exposed. The fact that someone like Pamela Anderson would join me in publishing a book, this book, Lust for Love, when you know she has appeared on the cover of uh, Playboy more than any other woman. And we debated this, and she says that Playboy is art, and I don't necessarily agree, but she definitely agrees about hardcore pornography. So the more, it's almost like we want to look at the Me Too movement, and we want to change male behavior, but without looking at some of the factors that are causing men to disrespect women, that are causing men to look at women as a means to an end rather than as an end in and of themselves. OK, I'm going to go around the table on this. Viv, what do you think? Well, I think it's a very interesting debate, but just reflecting on what we've been talking about tonight, I think that if a child has a very adverse experience like we've been talking about, it will affect their capacity to connect with other people and to experience real intimacy and to know who it is that they, you know... Often survivors talk about trusting someone that they should have been wary of because they've been abused by a person in position of power. And then for the rest of their lives, they're second-guessing themselves or their instincts about whether they're, they're able to trust and connect with, the, with their partner or have they chosen someone who is not you know, going to repeat those patterns. So I think the effects of childhood sexual abuse can be quite long-ranging and far-reaching and can affect that person's capacity to engage in really healthy uh, and rewarding relationships with others. Francis. No, I, I really couldn't add anything to what the rabbi said. It was exceptional. And I, it does, when you reflect back on Can what you we you elaborate have... on that just... <laughs> <laughs> Could I amplify how good you are? <laughs> but I would say, when you're thinking about what we've been talking about for the, the last six years of revelations around, you know, dysfunctional, distorted understandings of human sexuality. That's been one of the problems in the Catholic Church. And until we actually get honest about that, we're not going to really address even the deeper problems that you're talking about with regard to the abuse and objectification of women. Yeah, Jim. Uh, one of my uh, good friends, uh, uh, Father James Grant from uh, Victoria, an ex-Anglican who comes to the Catholic Church, uh, married with a family, I wrote the foreword to, to uh, a book where he was writing about the empowering of, of parishes, pointed out to me once that uh, Catholic priests don't address issues in the same way that Shmuel just addressed the issue. I've never heard a Catholic priest talk like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and a lack of understanding? Uh, no, I think, I think we're also uptight about most things. But they also don't talk about the international situation. They also don't talk about so much that we, in Parliament, have to address on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, you know, they, they get one... They get uh, 15 minutes uh, a week 
at 10% of their population. <laughs> It'd be good if they made it. Uh, I mean, you'd probably get 20%, Rabbi, if they got you there. <laughs> Christina. Uh, I have to convert, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would make two observations. Uh, one, that um, uh, when, the, when you ca talk about the Catholic Church, it has been obsessed with sex. Uh, it has been obsessed with sex as a tool for pro procreation. And I think it's part of its failure in dealing with and understanding the role of women, women in a family, uh, women in a community, women in leadership, uh, is because it fundamentally understands the role of sex in a relationship. You know, it thinks sex is just for procreation. And one of the most uh, interesting moments that happened in the past few years was when we had an Australian couple, Ron and Mavis Parola, went and participated in the, the church's teaching uh, synod on the family, and they told a bunch of bishops they're, they're, they're older, Ron and Mavis, they're probably about my parents' age. And they told the priests how much they enjoyed having sex with one another. And all the bishops were very uncomfortable about this because here was this older couple talking about having sex as a pleasurable thing. And so the church misunderstands sex and means they don't have the ability to talk to people about real relationships and loneliness. And then on the other hand, we have what the rabbi's talking about. And I can't help but think of Malcolm Turnbull's statement that not every um, act of disrespecting women ends in violence, but every viol act of violence against women and starts with an act of disrespect. And I would agree completely with the rabbi that when pornography leads to the disrespect of women, it fosters that culture of abuse. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to do something about uh, driving down domestic violence rates and the abuse of women in our community, we need to look at some of the causes. And I think you've got, you've hit the nail on the head with that, uh, that uh, that very eloquent speech. You thank you very me. much. Thank you, Christina. And that is all we have time for tonight. I'm sorry to say, please thank our panel, Francis Sullivan, Viv Waller, Jim Molan, Christina Keneally, and Rabbi Shmuley Botek. Thank you very much. Now, you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Tracy Holmes is joined by... Uh, Bly Grant from the UTS Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Now, next week, Annabel Crabb will host a special Q&A on women and leadership. She'll be joined by the Minister of Industry, Science and Technology, Karen Andrews, first Indigenous woman to be elected to the Federal Parliament, Labor's Linda Burney, Olympian and head of the Women's AFL, Nicole Livingston, Director of the Kalgoorlie Boulder Mining Innovation Hub, Sabina Shug, and Green Senator Sarah Hanson-Young. Until next week, good night.